j'ai l'honneur d'introduire donc cette, cette, sé cette séance. Euh, je vais immédiatement donc un, présenter notre prochain euh, intervenant. Il s'agit donc de Nicolas Sinai, professeur d'islamologie à l'université d'Oxford. C'est un immense connaisseur de, du texte coranique, oui, oui c'est si, j'insiste, euh, avec une bibliographie extrêmement prolifique. Euh, je ne citerai que un, un, un de ses derniers ouvrages, The Quran, an Historical Critical Introduction, euh, et aussi, très prochainement, je, je crois qu'au mois de juin, nous aurons um, um, a dictionary, an historical, critical dictionary of the Quran. Key terms of the Quran. Ah, Quran. Excusez-moi. Um, voilà. Et, et donc, um, votre intervention s'intitule Quranic Chronology and its Limits. Um, et vous avez immédiatement la parole. Et encore une fois, merci de votre, de votre présence parmi nous. Merci pour cette introduction. Je suis ravi d'être ici. Merci pour l'invitation. Je dois aussi remercier le Conseil européen de la recherche pour soutenir mon travail sur, sur le Coran. Et maintenant, je vais parler en anglais. Because um, it's much easier. I'm a bad. Um, so, um, when I first started publishing, or 12 years ago, one of, one of my first pieces was a very kind of spirited attempt to defend Quranic chronology, which I'll talk about in, in, in a moment. Um, um, and I had a little spat with um, what is now actually a dear friend of mine, Gabriel Reynolds, because we ended up on opposite sides of, um, of that debate. I think we've both calmed down a bit about it, um, but it's certainly an interesting opportunity to sort of, it was for me preparing this talk to think about how much of that maybe slightly Um, slightly exuberant, um, useful enthusiasm I, I, I still share, um, and, 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 and to some degree I, I still do. Um, so Quranic chronology, which figures in the title, um, is really a kind of shorthand for, um, for scholarly hypotheses about um, the relative temporal order of, of Quranic texts. So can we say um, whether bits of the Quran come before or after other bits? Um, um, and, and can we maybe Um, expand that into a system of classification um, that gives us um, the relative temporal position of, of any part of the Quran with regard um, to, um, to others. Um, this issue of the relative dating of the Quran, so the unfolding of Quranic discourse in, in history, if you will, um, is, um, um, I think, separate from that of the Quran's absolute um, date, um, so the relationship of the Quran to extra Quranic events like uh, the, the death of Muhammad, for instance, the, the early conquests. Um, um, but, but the two topics have been linked um, traditionally, and that's um, certainly a legacy of pre-modern uh, Muslim scholarship. Um, as, as you know, um, pre-modern Muslim scholars approach the Quran as, as a corpus of revelations that was um, revealed during the lifetime of, of Muhammad. So this Um, very much a historicizing, contextualist approach to the Quran at work there. Um, and that manifests itself on the one hand in, in um, narratives that are called asbab and nuzul, um, narratives about the occasions of, of revelation of particular Quranic passages. Um, but but as the same approach, I think the same underlying approach, also manifests itself in enumerations, in lists of Meccan and, uh, and Medinan surahs. And some of these lists... Um, implicitly or explicitly um, do not just subdivide the Quran into Meccan and Medinan texts, but also give an order um, of, of these surahs, or at least of their opening um, passages. Um, there's um, a, a now an excellent um, doctoral dissertation by Emmanuel Stefanidis, um, who has really written what I think is probably at the, at the time being the definit definitive history of Quranic chronologies. So she starts by looking at the earliest attestations of such chronological lists, and um, they, they seem to have emerged around the turn of the um, uh, first and second Islamic centuries in, in Khurasan. Um, they then get transmitted in uh, some of the classic works of um, Islamic um, Quran, Um, scholarship. Uh, um, but what Emmanuel observes, I think, fascinatingly, is that a, a lot of the um, Islamic authors who transmit these lists do seem to be slightly reticent about them. Um, um, and, and they don't actually get used a lot in tafsir um, as, as such. And, and, and she speculates, I think that's convincing, that that might be due to the fact that um, maybe these lists could be seen to undermine the adequacy of the canonical surah order of the Quran. Um, 
and and maybe also these lists could be seen to sort of be at odds with the traditional assumption that the Quran was revealed in, in very short fragments of kind of five to ten, ten verses. Um, so there's reasons why um, um, these enumerations weren't terribly popular in, in the pre-modern Islamic tradition, um, but it's fascinating to then see that one of those lists um, ends up in the hands of Gustav Weil, who is one of the founding fathers of um, sort of modern um, European um, serious scholarship on the Quran. Um, and he, um, he makes that his starting point um, for an investigation into the Quran's chronology. So something that's really quite a marginal component um, of the Islamic tradition then becomes um, almost a, a research paradigm in uh, 19th and early 20th century Western scholarship. So a curiosity of sorts turns into, into a paradigm. And, and I'm just paraphrasing Emmanuel here, but, but I think it's, it's an interesting sort of study in how um, um, you know, a tradition can undergo um, a, a very striking metamorphosis, in, in metamorphosis into, into something else in a different cultural context. Um, um, I think it's due to the fact that European interest in the Quran's chronology starts off this kind of list format that um, alternative you know, conceivable paradigms of making sense of the Quran's unfolding history weren't pursued. So um, prima facie, it's not you know, impossible to consider that maybe we could make sense of the Quran along the lines of uh, what um, biblical scholars call a documentary hypothesis. So the idea that you can take the Pentateuch, for instance, and you, um, um, you, you analyze it into the different sources or documents that um, were redacted together. So something like that could, you know, it's, it's a type of theory that, that could or could not work for the Quran, but, but that wasn't pursued. Um, and I think that's certainly due to the fact that the list format, in, in a way, reigned supreme from the beginnings of um, Western scholarship. Now, um, the fact that the alternative paradigm isn't, isn't pursued doesn't necessarily mean that kind of, people took the wrong approach. Um, I mean, I, I, I personally do think that the approach taken is largely tenable, but, but it means that um, this assumption that you can make sense of the Quran as a sort of linear, linear sequence of... Um, discursive units, one after the other, reigned um, supreme from very, very early on. There's some evidence in the Quran itself that um, I, I, I would say, you know, um, despite my attempts to sort of remain impartial, impartial at, at, during this part of, of my presentation, I think there's some evidence in the Quran that, that does point towards the kind of linear diachronic um, paradigm. There are, there are two, well, there's one verse in particular, which some of you may know, where um, it seems that the Quranic um, opponents um, challenge the Quranic messenger and you know, um, ask him why was this not uh, sent down jumlatan wa hidatan, sort of in, in, in one fell swoop or in, in sort of as, as one unity. And kind of the implication seems to be that Quranic discourse comes in installments, um, and that actually seems to be a liability in the context of the Quran against which the Quran needs to defend itself. And I, I think that gives some, um, some support to the kind of assumption that we, we might be able to reconstruct a linear um, sequence of um, um, of, of units of, of Quranic discourse. Um, the most famous product of European chronological scholarship is, is certainly the um, surah chronology that is usually um, named after uh, Theodor Neldeke, um, um, who um, was translated into Arabic at the capable hands of George Tama. Um, um, but to speak simply of the Neldeke chronology is, is really to underplay the, the formative impact of, of Gustav Weil, who was much less of a sort of mainstream figure, um, a much more colorful character, um, much less canonical perhaps. Um, but he was certainly the first scholar who, um, who proposed that the Meccan surahs could be subdivided into three uh, periods, the infamous um, early, middle, and late Meccan surahs. And, and Nordica then takes that and, um, and runs with it. Um, so that's one particular type of chronological theory. Um, there are others. Um, Hartwig Hirschfeld, for instance, who writes in 1902, um, has a different attempt of making sense of, um, of, of the linear sequence of Quranic texts. Um, um, there's, of course, the commentary of Richard Bell, um, which is a very different, um, different uh, attempt of, of analyzing um, Quranic uh, chronology. Um, so to come back to Nerdick and Weil, um, so they started off this list that was transmitted um, via Zarkashi and, and Dia, uh, Dia Bakri. Uh, but they did also, I think, very clearly aim to test the information they are given, they find in their 
um, Muslim predecessors by um, drawing on observations of, of style, terminology, content. So they try to tweak um, um, what they find in the Muslim tradition. Um, and that's one, I think, big um, controversial issue un until today, effectively. Um, is it the case that a Nerdica style chronology can succeed in largely basing itself on considerations of, of style that are internal to the Quran? Or is it the case that uh, the chronologies that we see certainly um, being used by scholars are essentially dependent on um, assumptions that draw from or that derive from the Islamic tradition that are based on extra textual trans, uh, um, traditions about, about the Quran. Uh, and and that, that is very much the case that uh, Gabriel Reynolds um, put forward in, in his uh, French article in Arabica some 10 years ago, that this is essentially circular, that um, you approach the Quran with certain assumptions about um, Mecca and Medina in mind, and then you allocate passages that talk about Jews or seem to polemicize against the Israelites to the Medina period, but all you've done is basically you've um, cut the Quran up according to your preconceptions. This isn't really um, an argument as much as a self-fulfilling um, prophecy of sorts. So I think the appropriate response to this worry of circularity um, is to find a way of constructing a relative chronology of the Quran that is maximally independent of, of extra Quranic assumptions. I mean, I, I personally you know, don't doubt the traditional um, paradigm of the Quran's genesis in Mecca and Medina um, at the beginning of the seventh century, but, but I think for theoretical purposes, it would be good to be able to work out a chronology that doesn't take that for granted. Um, I think that uh, that argument has been made, made, made most compellingly and um, impressively in an article by Bernard Sardegui in um, 2011, um, another massive piece, possibly in the same issue in Arabica, which yeah. it, which is weird. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yes. Took me a while to sort of uh, yeah, catch on to that, um, which is a very sort of um, sophisticated stylometric uh, study of the Quran with a lot of math um, involved. So something that um, certainly in um, parts um, transcends my, um, my horizon. Um, but uh, um, I think that is a milestone uh, in chronological scholarship and, and, and the basic argument that Behnam, I think, makes quite successfully is that the mean verse length of Quranic passages, so how long a verse in a surah um, tends to be, um, displays a relationship of um, smooth covariance with a host of lexical features. So there seems to be a link between mean verse length and lexicon, and he tests that against um, three different lists of, of Quranic lexemes. Um, um, we, you know, uh, and he's looking at a lot of them um, by using computers, of course. Um, so there seems to be a link here. Um, these two features that I, th well, one would certainly prima facie think of as, as properly independent seem to, um, to, to co-vary in a way that requires explanation. And there's a phenomenon here that can't just be a coincidence. And what he suggests is that the assumption of a gradual development over time is the best explanation for the phenomenon. Um, so the idea that um, it, over the course of the Quran's genesis, both verse length changed and, and also lexicon changed and, and perhaps um, content changed to, or maybe literary features changed to. Um, so, so I think that's um, um, quite a rigorous and, and sort of epistemologically principled case for an internal chronology of the Quran um, that is anchored in imminent um, features of the text. The um, specific chronology that Behnam looks at in his article is a, um, is a modified version of, of the chronology that was um, worked out by um, an Iranian academic and politician, uh, Mehdi Bazargan, who died in the 1990s. Um, but it's, it's, it's a chronology that's based on the assumption that mean verse length um, grew over time, that verses tended to become longer over the course of Muhammad's ministry, which is also kind of the implicit assumption of, of, of Weil and Nerdike. Even though Weil and Nerdike, they, they don't really look at it quantitatively. I mean, Nerdike will say things like, oh, the, the language becomes dull and prosaic, but what he really means by that is verses get longer. I mean, that's a perfectly neutral and descriptive way of, of capturing this, um, that, um, that um, maybe there's a way with some of the needlessly dismissive language that, that Nerdike um, does use from time to time. Um, so the um, desideratum, um, which I'm arguing for, of 
separating Quranic chronology from the traditional narrative of the life of Muhammad, um, I mean, for epistemological purposes, uh, not necessarily because I don't believe in the existence of Muhammad, but that desideratum um, is, is, is also interesting, illustrated in a very interesting way by recent work that's been done by Tommaso Tesse, um, who's published an article some two years ago in um, oh, Journal Asiatique, I think, uh, Qurans in Contexts, or, yeah, I think. Um, yeah. So w w what, what he um, argues is that um, the historical period that sort of is encompassed by a relative chronology of the Quran um, ought to be viewed as extending well beyond the lifetime of Muhammad. Um, he's clearly operating with the idea that you know, it was the, um, uh, the Umayyads and the Abd al-Malik who um, put the finishing touches to the corpus. So it's, it's, it's an extended process of, um, of, 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 of scriptural genesis, um, um, much, much longer than just 20 years. Um, but the interesting feature about that article is that nonetheless, despite these very different this de very different vision of how the Quran emerged, to say also endorses a, a chronology that effectively takes a group of surahs as the original kernel of the Quran that largely corresponds to the early Meccan surahs of Weil and Neldika. So there seems to be interesting agreement on what the original layer of the Quran is. It's just that there's a difference as to whether the rest of the Quran is then maybe um, datable to the lifetime of Muhammad or not. But, but, but there seems to be agreement um, as to the original sort of kernel or, if you will, stem cell of, of, of Quranic discourse. I mean, Tomaso doesn't really massively belabor this agreement, but I think it's quite striking that the surahs he looks at are basically the early Meccan surahs. Although, of course, Tomaso wouldn't call them early Meccan because, I mean, that's a very sort of traditional term that, that he would probably balk at. But um, I think that's actually grants to be optimistic, right? It seems that whatever your background assumptions about, um, you know, how the Quran emerged, and how um, Islam got off the ground, mm -hmm. it seems that people can nonetheless agree on, on sort of basic um, um, claims about the Quran's relative chronology. Now, um, maybe some health warnings. How am I for time? Um, you have to, uh, eight minutes. Eight minutes left. Okay, right. Um, I'll just uh, see how far I get. Um, Ten minutes? Okay. No, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to negotiate here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so Emmanuel, in her in her in her coverage of um, chrono chronological theories in, in modern Quran scholarship, um, um, I, I think she pays very interesting, very welcome attention to how how chronologies of the Quran effectively construct storylines, um, construct what she calls a fabula, um, a narrative. Um, so what, what what you're often given is a package that involves both a certain amount of textual data and a storyline that makes sense of that data, and, and the two are, are sort of mutually supportive. So the textual data is presented in a way that already implies the storyline and, and uh, vice versa. Um, uh, Emmanuel isn't really in the business of defending one uh, particular chronology of the Quran or another, so she's quite happy to let that stand as a general observation that, you know, historiography is, is always narrative, and, and to some degree I think that's true. I mean, we make sense of the past by telling stories about it, so maybe at the most general level that, that's hard to take issues with. Um, take care. Good to see you. Um, but I, I would still add to that that... Um, we as scholars of the Quran and early Islam, we, we probably do need to get much better as, at um, sort of turning storylines or narratives into, into hypotheses. And I, I think Behnam's article is actually a, a, a model of how to do that. Um, so rather than just kind of telling stories that sound plausible and that involve a citation of different bits of the Quran, at the right um, at the right junctures, um, I, I think it would be much uh, much more helpful to be maybe slightly more explicit about um, defining a certain data set um, and a certain um, set of features of that data set, which are to be explained, the explanandum, if you will, and then um, identifying what the hypothesis is that is meant to make sense of that explanandum, um, um, and to then also consider how that hypothesis sort of competes with alternative ones that are maybe equally tenable. I mean, you know, which, which one's more elegant, which one's more simple. I think um, there should always be sort of a comparative um, or competitive aspect to one's um, treatment in that sense. Um, um, I think it would all also obviously be helpful to address countervailing data. And I think it's also really important to then be honest about 
where one as a scholar resorts to auxiliary hypotheses that have a very different function from the initial hypothesis. So an auxiliary hypothesis is a proposition that helps fend off objections or reconcile a hypothesis with evidence that is maybe problematic. Um, uh, it doesn't serve to explain the original explanandum. So I think we could probably, and, and that includes myself, um, um, I think maybe one way of responding to Emmanuel's argument, which I guess I'm, I'm keen to do in some way, even though <laughs> um, I'm quite impressed, would be to sort of think much more carefully about the epistemology of Quranic chronologies and, and be uh, much more explicit about the different components that enter into our theorizing, rather than just telling a plausible story and then than hoping that the story will will sway, because obviously different stories could could sway, um, um, and and yeah, uh, and maybe that's not a um, very satisfactory position to be in. Um, right. So that was my two cents on that. Um, um, may another point to just make here would be that I do think that constructing a relative chronology of the Quran remains an ongoing endeavor. So I I, I don't think we can use the um, no the chronology, chronology as a sort of a, a, a scaffolding of, um, of factual certainty. I think, George, you called it as, as, as something that's munazza, right? As if kind of this list of surahs in a particular order um, is, is a set of, of hard facts. No, it, it's a theory, and, and we should probably treat it as such. Um, um, I think that's particularly crucial when it comes to the so-called middle Meccan period of Nerdike. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure that that can stand. I, I'm not sure about... Um, the boundaries that Nerdike draws between the middle Meccan surahs and the early and the later Meccan ones, on the other hand. So I, I usually just um, speak of early Meccan and later Meccan surahs because I'm, I'm, I'm really very doubtful about the demarcatability of this intermediate group um, of surahs. Um, but there might be other respects in which one can sort of improve and improve on and, and, and tweak this uh, chronology. Um, so it's a hypothesis um, subject to further improvement. That also means that I think when we write about a given topic in the Quran, one shouldn't necessarily adopt the default exposition whereby one goes through kind of four chronological stages, like, you know, um, I don't know, anger in the Quran, in the early Meccan surahs, in the middle Meccan, and the later Meccan, and the Medinan surahs. I, mean, I, I think that might be a strategy of exposition that might, be, might lend itself to some topics, um, but I think there will also be um, other topics that um, that maybe are appropriately dealt with um, in a synchronic uh, fashion, where one can just talk about you know time in the Quran without necessarily um, going through different uh, periods. So I, I think one needs to be open to that, and one shouldn't let the Nordic chronology sort of um, tempt one into constantly looking for change. Um, and sort of shifts over time. It may just be the case that for a given topic, the Quranic you know, position is, is largely consistent over time. Um, but I, I do think that um, chronological discriminations, um, distinctions can be useful, so maybe I want to close with that. Um, I think um, they can help define more sharply the literary and, and doctrinal features of the Quran um, or of different stages of the Quran. So, so one example, um, I guess, I would still endorse is the fact that the text that Nerdike, and I suppose also Tommaso identifies as early Meccan, um, they lack explicit assertions of monotheism. And um, that's an observation that, that Parr had already made in the 1950s. So um, statements to the effect that in Ilaha Kum Lawahad, your God is only one God, only seem to sort of fade into Quranic discourse around the transition between the early Meccan and the later Meccan surahs. Um, this doesn't seem to have been a doctrinal feature of the earliest Quranic proclamations. Now, that's not to say that the earliest Quranic proclamations are polytheistic, but, but I think it is relevant to note that assertions, explicit assertions of monotheism don't seem to have been sort of on the charismatic agenda of the Quran initially. I mean, I think eschatology is much more prominent. So um, this theme that there's only one God seems to sort of come in at a slightly um, later point in time, and then um, one can, of course, think about why that might, might be the case. But, but, but obviously, that is a chronological uh, observation, and, and I think that's a tenable one. Another example would be um, David Marshall's work about the different conceptions of divine punishment in the Meccan and Medinan surahs. Um, I think that largely holds, and that, that again, is obviously predicated on a diachronic um, distinction between uh, two groups uh, of, of texts. Um, one reason why, um, um, maybe to just yeah, finish on 
another reflection on the epistemology of of chronologies. W one reason why chronological distinctions allow us to um, um, maybe get a more precise sense of what's happening in a given group of, of, of surahs is because they underwrite um, the possibility of looking at part of the Quran without immediately bringing in the rest of the Quran. So if you were to look at the early Meccan surahs that, that lack explicit assertions of monotheism in combination, immediately in combination with the rest of the Quran, then obviously there's enough monotheism elsewhere in the Quran to balance out the fact that, that you don't get explicit assertions of monotheism in uh, Surah 101 or 85. Um, um, so that you wouldn't even be able to make the observation that a certain group of texts doesn't, doesn't have this particular um, doctrinal feature. So, so what, um, what I guess um, diachronic distinctions do is they kind of thin out the interpretive data that is immediately relevant. They kind of they, they, they constrain the um, the domain of immediately relevant text, um, uh, and they thereby um, work against the sort of common denominator interpretation of the Quran, where uh, it, it's kind of the average across the text um, as a whole that that will emerge as, as one's interpretation of the text. So. Um, um, so there are limits to Quranic chronology, um, but um, I, I nonetheless do tend to think that um, um, it's a you know, feasible endeavor and that it does also have its promises. I think I'll just end here, so any questions would be welcome. Thank you.